Let's pray, shall we? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is sharp and double-edged. Lord, I pray as we uh, unpick some of the, the, the wonder of the book of Judges this morning, that you would speak to us, and uh, Lord, that you get us thinking, that you hand to be on us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, good to see you all. Didn't expect to be here, but um, our technical issue this morning is sickness. Not I was having on with the school, but our um, three-hour sound text you on holiday, and the fourth one, uh, Emily has got COVID. Um, and the thought of setting up at the school, technical-wise, is beyond my ability. Be able to carry plug a turn on the day, much more, much more at my level. So, so that's why we're here. Anyway, we are in the book of Judges, so we're in Judges six to eight. I'm not going to read a chunk this morning, just because there's so much. Because we're in, uh, we're in uh, the zone of Gideon. And alongside Samson, he gets the most words, he gets the longest, uh, one of the two long, long pieces about these judges. So that, that tells us something immediately, this is significant, uh, it's a significant story. And if you've been around church yeah, for any time in your life, he, he may have become a bit of a hero. Shiggy is one of those, he's a Sunday school story guy, Othniel doesn't make it, you know, Shamgar doesn't make it, Gideon definitely. Definitely makes it. So we start with, we will start, we will read the first bit. So in Judges chapter 6. So from a familiar start, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So we've got that, remember that spiral? So down we come again. Here it is again. Again, again, Israelites did evil um, in the eyes of the Lord. But then remember those uh, that, that how to read Hebrew narrative? One of them is the atypical thing, so that you expect a judge to appear that the evil in the eyes of the Lord. What happens next in judges normally is that people cry out to God and God gives them a deliverer, a judge, who names them. And the last one was a woman, so that kind of went, oh, that's interesting. Skewed us that way. And then this time, he does something completely different and he gives us a prophet. Uh, so this is the bit of the beginning story we rarely look at. In fact, we rarely look at the beginning or the end of Gideon. So they're the two places we were uh, we were focusing on. Because John's going to do the middle bit, I think, mean, <laughs> kids later. So he, uh, so the cry out, the the, the Lord, um, the, the, uh, um, the, the 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 evil. He gives them over to Midian. This is the most oppressive uh, regime we've faced so far. So up until now. Um, things have been, you know, reasonable. They've managed to have life under the oppression. But here we have, uh, we're in caves, we're hiding. This is the most oppressive. Uh, verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. Ah, the minute! That's not what Judges does. He always sent them a deliverer. So it's atypical. He's like, oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And he sent them a prophet. And the prophet basically tells them, how rubbish they are, which is really interesting. So the prophet comes, and we have a, a prophet with no name, as I said in the other sheet there, a prophet with no name, to remind them how bad they are. Uh, this is why you are in trouble, this is why Midian has come, this is why there's problems, because you have wandered off the path, you have decided to deny the name of the Lord. And there's this lovely little uh, link with the, you know, the Shema, and he was Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is, is one, so that's the the Jewish daily prayer the first thing that Jewish boys learn, that God is one. And then there's this little kind of play on that from the prophet. The prophet comes uh, and he speaks these words. Uh, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you out of Egypt, I will have a slavery, I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of the United oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave their life. I said to you, I am the Lord your God, you have worshipped the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The first thing that they forget when they cry out to God is not a rescue, but a reminder. This is why this has happened, this is why you're in this, uh, this situation. I wonder whether um, it's hard for session because I always want to start preaching. <laughs> Don't preach. Feel free. Well, yeah. 
Well, isn't this the place of the church to be the prophetic voice of the nation? To say, hey, if we, if we come back to God, perhaps the nation will change. You know, but they need a rescue. And in my life, we've been looking at uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. And um, this is a Jesus in the Old Testament moment, I think, because we have a prophet coming to say, turn back to God. We might call him John the Baptist. And then we have a deliverer who comes, we might call him Jesus. So we've got an uh, unnamed prophet and um, Gideon. I might be stretching it, but I'm a preacher, and that's what we do. So amazing, this, this prophet comes, and then they get the deliverer. So he comes and reminds them why they, where they are, why they are. Remember, this stuff has been pulled together many years after it happened, in probably in a time of oppression, probably when they are in captivity. And so we've got this constant demand, listen, if we put our trust in God, he will rescue us, he will deliver us. If we keep denying him, we will still we will continue to be a place uh, of oppression. And then we get Gideon, and I, and I don't know you, but I really like Gideon. I like him because he is a little bit rubbish. Anybody full of faith this morning? Hey. Hey. I mean, I'm full of faith this morning, but I was, I'm just having it completely stressed this week over stuff with the school, stuff with us, stuff with sickness. Oh, it was like, oh, it's, someone's meant to be quiet and, and chill. That someone's not going to the rules. Like, you know, they're just, so, like, Gideon, I'm often full of faith and full of doubt at the same time. Often in the midst of, I absolutely trust you, Lord, but I'm just going to try and make this work for myself. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think he, he is so loved because, uh, because of that. But his name, like all, often in Judges, the names are really interesting, really important. And his name means chopper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we have to think, oh, is that what his parents called him? Or is that a, um, a hindsight name? Does he become chopper because he chops down the idols, he chops down the Midianites, he chops down the enemy? Is that why he becomes chopper? Or, is that, or, or does he live up to his name? And some of you live up to your names, don't you? I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> certainly often, you have to be really careful what you call your children. And then for most of us in this room, we've kind of gone beyond that stage, so it's too late. You know? But, but I, I would say that younger people are kids be careful what they talk because I think it has names of power. So um, my name means um, uh, leader, victory of the people. And I think, oh, I am a leader. Uh, is that, was I named, oh, is that prophetic? No, you know, you know all those things. My name also means small market, a piece of wood, Nick. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to steal, so, you know, we, we don't want to push it too far. <laughs> With a name like that, she'll be arrested. Anyway, we'll move on. But he also gets this carrying that name, Jerob, Baal, let Baal contend. So you've got these two names a, a, a pagan name, a Hebrew name, both of which are about warfare. And, oh, look at that. We have to stop telling us he's saying, is this retrograde or is it actually. Prophetic. I don't think it's prophetic, that's his real name, and it says something about who he is, uh, identifying who we will, who will be in days to come. But we love knowing because um, he is not a mighty warrior. The first encounter he gets, verse 12, with God, and the angel comes and says to him, How are we doing, mighty warrior? And he is threshing some uh, wheat in a wine press. So you normally fresh wheat on a big flat surface with the uh, <laughs> open because you need to keep the wind and you throw it up and the chaff blows away because that's lighter and the wheat falls to the ground. <laughs> and you don't get it to grit in your bread, and that's why little eastern people have terrible teeth. That's the, and right up until the last hundred years really, because you would chew on bits that were a bit firm, because all the heavy stuff, the good stuff, falls. But if you do that in the open and somebody after you stop, they spot you, they kill you, and they stay in your grave. So he's in a wine press which is covered. Um, you know, I, I, in my head I have like a French thing, you know, with a, like a big wooden bowl. Yeah. It may not have been like that, it's probably more like a stone trough. So a narrow place. But so he's trying to do something. So we've got this great tension with him. He's trying to do something, but he is not a mighty warrior. 
And there is this thing spoken over, which I think is amazing. God speaks <coughs> things over us sometimes that are not yet. Is that in that case? He becomes, he becomes what God has spoken over uh, in, in the days to come. And uh, what God calls uh, will be. And then we get the angel of the Lord. And if you just if you've got a Bible, if you've got a phone, just have a little look at uh, a couple of verses for me. And what do you notice about the angel? We've talked a bit next year about it. So verse 12, verse, this verse 12 to verse 22. So we get lots of repetition, but just, just read and see what you notice about the angel of the Lord. So the text seems to switch between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. Yeah. Any any other comments? Any other? Yeah. It might not be true here, but is it true that often in the Old Testament talk about the angel talking about the angel? Is that good? So yeah, I think that's good. Is that good? So the angel. So we get a different article. Um, so, um, so it's a, a Jesus appearance pre-incarnation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I just love that the angel came to start. I never loved the conversation. <laughs> I was patient. I was patient. I'm just going to go and sort out this lamp for you. And then the little detail is he goes and makes a broth. Like, see, so, he has to, so the lamp is not the goat, is not dead. He has to take the goat, sacrifice the goat, skin the goat. Cook the goat. <laughs> no, what does that take? Chop the goat. Chop the goat. I mean, the angels there. Great. I mean, the, um, my, my I changed the title on the other hand about that because they did say the angel of the Lord or the Lord of the angels. But well, that would give away without the actual leave. Because, uh, as June said, there is this, uh, this constant switching. The angel of the Lord, the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the Lord. Um, is what uh, is that what Jean said? Is this a theophany? A great word about that word. Is it a theophany? Is this Jesus in the Old Testament? Because this is the, the um, God in human form, or we have a name for him, we? we call him Jesus. So that's very interesting. Can you think of any others, any other theophanies in the Old Testament where you have God in human form? Abraham. Abraham, who was it? Which one? Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Genesis 14. Yeah. Five verses. Yeah. Um, Daniel chapter 6, is it something like that? Um, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who's that in the furnace with? Yeah. Any others? It's just the, the journey in, in the wilderness that the angel of the Lord worked with them. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the pillar of fire and the pillar of blood as well. Yeah. Ezekiel 43, <coughs> where the shiny man takes Ezekiel and shows him around the temple and tells him what is to come and talks about living water coming. Um, yeah, uh, Genesis 14, Abraham and Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek was no beginning and no end. Hebrews clearly says, oh, by the way, that was Jesus. <laughs> Just actually say quite a thing with that, but, uh, so, so we have the, we, it's not, this wouldn't be a, uh, wouldn't be too much of a stretch to go, oh, this actually is. The Lord. Often, if it's, uh, um, if it's an angel that isn't the Lord, you, the angel will be named. So, you get the Gabriel name quite a few times in Scripture, particularly. So, yeah, you can go and pick that later. It doesn't matter. If it isn't Jesus, it doesn't matter. But it's interesting, you know, and that's what Deep was about, isn't it? And then we get um, to his sign, and he says, Well, if the Lord is with us, Will you um, give me a sign? And he asks him to wait. He goes and brings this thing of worship. He, he worships. And um, we'll read it. The, uh, the angel, the Lord, burns the sign. Uh, verse 26, probably. In chapter 6. Then the angel of the Lord, verse 21. The angel of the Lord preached <coughs> to me, as he done never did, the tip of his staff that was in his hand. Fire fled from the rock and consumed me of the bread. And into the Lord disappeared. Interestingly, verse 23, God is still speaking to. Him. So into the Lord disappeared, but verse 23, the Lord said to him. So he's he's got a physical encounter and he's got 
some kind of spiritual emotional compound where it's healing and uh, healing God. But, but, he, but he gets a sign. So think about your spiritual life right now. If you were looking for a sign, and what you got was a physical encounter with God where you burnt up the altar. That would be enough for you, wouldn't it? Would it? I mean, maybe not. Maybe not. You know, it depends on, depends on your on your faith level. It's not enough for Gideon. Again, one of the reasons I like him. Because then he goes, but I'm just going to put this face out. And the point can't read the captions, it's so small. But he's uh, just that kind of. Uh, see if I can read it. Okay, God, give me a minute. Let's try this again. Today, the fleece is dry, the rock is soaked, and the ground is made damp. Then that means that the uh, Midianites and I cannot be friends. And <laughs> 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 this is like he keeps. What about this? What about this? What about this? Uh, this is it's an old word in the Old Testament. And, and are we allowed to bring this into the New Testament? Are we allowed to bring this into our. And I was fear. Is it all pain to ask God for signs and wonders? And, uh, and at what point do you go, yeah, God was really speaking? You know, this is the motorboat, the helicopter, the rescue plane joke, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm waiting for you to give me a sign, Lord, well, I'll give you the three. <laughs> you know, give you, if you really lack his faith. Um, well, you know, and Hebrews doesn't comment on that because the Hebrews will comment on that because Hebrew narrative doesn't comment on itself. So you have to read it and go, is that all right? I don't think it is, personally. I think he's, he's a bit, come on, mate. You know, you've got the message. But I've been a pastor for a while, I realise that lots of us need more than one little encouragement, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and not just for the flock, but for the pastor as well. Okay, Lord, what do you say? What should I do? <coughs> There's definitely, definitely great uh, all over this story. So we've got the... Like God is patient. We see God is patient just in, in him waiting for the offering to come. And we see his patience uh, um, uh, with Gideon here. And then we get to the great bit a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Brilliant. He's, uh, I mean, he's inspired all sorts of people. He's inspired Bibles to be put into, um, into hotels and hospitals and prisons all over the world. Uh, it's an amazing uh, inspirational person. If you, if you actually Google Gideon, mostly what you get is uh, jokes and funnies about Gideon Bibles and you know, people sleeping with them and all sorts of uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, really, really uh, interesting. So there's, there's loads to dig out in chapter 7. I know you read it before on that. Uh, there is that great kind of troop selection thing where Gideon calls the people to battle and they come. And God says to him, you've got two men. And as a church leader, that is that is totally anti what you think. We need more, don't we? We need more people. We need more gifting. We need, we need more worship team. We need more, 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 more. And there's this great thing in Gideon where God's going, get rid of him. Get rid of him. You need less, 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 less. It is, it is atypical. It is not what we expect. We expect the bigger army to win. On a red judge, so we know in Sony Deborah, less is more. Here we go again, less is, is more. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a funny old thing, the, the, the Latin is interesting, isn't it? So the, we're in chapter 7. Yeah, we're in chapter 6 still. <laughs> 7. And he's, uh, he's, watching, he's watching the troops. And some are bringing it to, the, to your mouth, and you'll have heard sermons. One is saying, when they were the watchful ones, because they're doing that, watching out for the enemy. So they're the watchful ones who want the better soldiers, and the others are just thirsty, sticking their heads under the water. I don't know, I just seem, it seems like this odd thing that God does. You know? <laughs> Sometimes God does odd things with odd people. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, he, he lifts people and then the Lord speaks to him again. And the, the central message of Gideon is that he is a man of prayer. So even though he's, he lacks faith, even though he is a bit cowardly, even though he wants God to speak to him over and again, that, that actually is part of the central message of it. He wants God to speak to him over and over again. And, and the Lord does. And if you contrast him with uh, Samson, I won't do that right now massively, but 
Samsung plays twice. And Gideon plays all the time. Almost on every paragraph. You've got the Lord saying, from the end of the Lord turning up, you've got Gideon hearing things from God. It is incredible. Incredible, especially through the central bit of his life when he's being uh, when he's being prayed for. So he has this uh, he, 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 he's encouraged to go into the enemy camp. Interesting. Shades of, uh, of David and others in the Old Testament. He goes into the enemy camp and he hears a dream. Uh, verse 13. And the dream is fascinating. So it's a pagan, it's a pagan man having a dream. That's that is an amazing thing that happens throughout history. With people dreaming of God speaking, even when they don't follow him. <coughs> uh, Hillary from our church is a, a baptism this morning uh, in another church with a guy from a Pakistani Muslim background who's come to faith in Jesus through a Somali guy who came to faith in Jesus through a dream. Oh, God is still doing this. Amazing. So, so he goes and he hears the dream. Uh, and then so we have this um, we have this this combination of, of God's work. So we have uh, the supernatural, uh, the, 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 there was a, there was a dream involved, we have an incredible strategy. So Angie and I have been in this valley in the, in the Middle East. And even um, you can kind of stand on the on the little hill and you can see the valley and you can see where Gideon and the troops are placed and it is flat and it's like a dead, like a corn. And, and you look at them, look at that. You think it's, it's 10 o'clock at night. So the scripture tells us it's the um, second watch or third watch, whatever it says, 10 o'clock at night. The guard has just changed, so the new guards come out. So they're a bit night blind. You've got no electricity, no electric lights. By 10 o'clock, most people are asleep. It's not, um, it's pre digital, pre digital age. So they've gone to bed after the meeting. So most of these guys are asleep up with the sun, five or something. The, so you've got this incredible strategy going on, and then you've got this incredible humour because they've got um, trumpets and lights. So in every hand you've got a, a torch with a light in it, and the other hand you've got a trumpet. And their battle cry is what? Just the sword of the Lord and forgive him. Where are the swords? Yes. <laughs> you haven't got a third arm. With a sword. <laughs> it's a bit. It's a bit. That's that that evil. You look again. So they smash the smash the lights, they blow the trumpets, and they start to move down the hill. And, and we're not sure, we think possibly there's a Canaanite, uh, Midianite deity that, or, or demon that moves like that, that there's fire and noise. Because there's, there's loads of them, and they all wet themselves. <laughs> and they start to kill each other. And when I was a kid, I used to, this used to confuse me. Why would you kill people on your who are on, who are on your side? Well, they haven't got, you know, they're not all wearing uniforms, it's not like football where they're all got different shirts on something. But the just tells us this is a load of different peoples. So you've got all these different people groups in this valley who are all trying to invade from the Hebrew, they are not all together. And suddenly you've got this noise and it it, it causes a bit of civil war. It's very interesting. As we read through Judges, we realize actually that Gideon and the guys at this point stop. They, they, they hold their ground, the Hebrew says. So they don't actually come into the fight. They let the fight happen in front of them because of the noise and the fire. <coughs> but they still haven't drawn a sword yet. Very, very interesting. If you like that sort of thing. Um, so you get this great, um, great battle cry. At that point, I would really like to stop the story of Gideon. Because at that point, he is fantastic. He's listened to God, he's been obedient, he's, he's moved, and then they've seen uh, the enemy rises, the enemy flees, all that stuff. And then it starts just to go a little bit wrong. And that's one of the reasons I love scripture. It doesn't, it doesn't kind of candy core or, or um, whitewash the, the, the dodgy bits of these heroes. So, um, Gideon starts to believe his own press. And uh, you know, it happens to people all the time. It happens to mega church pastors and local church pastors all the time. You think you're better than you really are. And uh, the Lord has a way of going, just reminds me, actually, you know, what Gideon does is they win the battle. Uh, the battle's over. I'm skipping right through it because there's lots of detail. But they win the battle. And the, the, the Midianites, they are Ishmaelites. And the scripture tells us in chapter 8 that they all wear earrings. So they've all got the gold earring in their, in their ears. And, and so the people come and say, well, oh, 
Did he you made amazing? You led us, you know, chopper, fantastic, you won the battle of grace. Uh, what can we do? And he goes, Oh, well, just give me a, a bit of tribute, one ear each. So that so the you know the lot of the ancient ear is they whatever they've killed or captured is theirs. So they all just bring in one gold ear. Great, he's got a bit of got a bit of money for his, uh, his troubles. But then he makes the gold into an ephod, a magic shirt um, in the uh, biblical terms. So you know, Moses wore an ephod, Aaron wore an ephod, like uh, it's like a holy garment. But, but Gideon's not a priest. He's not allowed to do that. So he makes basically this magic shirt. And I'm not excited to say. I will stop. He makes this magic shirt, and that is the start of his downfall. And the end of his downfall is when they say, We want to make you king. And he says, I won't be your king. And then we get the story of Abimelech, who are one of Gideon's sons, whose name means. My father is the king. So you see this guy who's been faithful and praying to God all the way through, and actually what destroys him is success. And that's where we'll leave the story. Right? And it tells us that you don't always, maybe, perhaps you shouldn't always get what you want. Right? Yeah. Great. Get home and pray for. Get home and pray for. Thanks for being with us.